Back in the 1980s, and indeed in the 70s before that, there was this programming language called BASIC, short for Beginner's All-Purpose Symbolic Instruction Code. It came pre-installed on every new machine you bought, and for most of us, it was the first programming language we learned. This is not what this video is about, though, but I like the connection anyways, so I'll take it a bit further. BASIC was very simple. And because we didn't update or upgrade our computers much back in those days, we were mostly stuck with what the machine came with. You could buy expansions uh, like this one here, but then your programs would only work for those who also had these expansions. So mostly we stayed with the basic version of BASIC. Because of its simplicity and the fact that it never changed, it was both easy to learn and easy to understand. But also, because it was so basic and almost too simple, we sometimes had to trick it into doing what we wanted and exploit some of the strange and unique aspects of it. In those cases, we had to go deeper to actually understand what was going on, but I'd argue that it gave us a really good, I'd say a really solid understanding of the basics of programming, as well as the basics of the machine. And that is what this video is about. The basics of programming. In fact, it's going to be a whole series. The list of subjects I want to cover is still growing and there doesn't seem to be any end in sight. There's always something interesting to learn, something worth exploring even deeper, something new to understand. So this series is going to continue alongside my videos about programming design where the perfect programming process, that one, was just the first. But then, what are the basics? I mean, this channel is intended for those of you who know a bit about programming. You know about variables, if statements, for loops, arrays, a bit about functions and objects. So aren't those the basics? And don't we already know them then? Well, yes, but actually no. Programming 2.0 is about this something beyond programming that I talked about in the introduction. The knowledge you need to have in order to design and construct programs and not just writing code. So very much something that lies ahead of you if you think of learning as a journey. But it isn't enough to know what lies ahead of you. Of course, it's important to know the destination after all, that is why I begin with the end in the perfect programming process. But you also need to understand where you are. There is this famous quote by philosopher Søren Kierkegaard, or Søren Kierkegaard as you might know him. If one is truly to succeed in leading a person to a specific place, one must first and foremost take care to find him where he is and begin there. I really like this quote because it is at the same time so banal because of course you can't guide a person to anywhere if you don't know where they are right now and also so profound because you need to understand where someone is in their life or their troubles or their learning path if you are to help them get any further. No matter if you're a therapist, a doctor, an investment manager or a teacher you need to first listen and understand before giving advice, before suggesting solutions. What could be the right solution for one person might not work for someone else. Teachers often quote Kierkegaard saying this, because as a teacher you don't just spout facts. You need to understand your students, know where they are, what they already know and understand, in order to find the best way of explaining the best way of helping each and every one of them learn. And while I can't know where each and every one of you who are watching are and thus can't actually lead you to the place beyond programming, I'm not really the one teaching you. You are. And I believe that the better you understand where you already are, meaning understanding what lies behind and beneath what you know, the better prepared you'll be for the journey ahead, 
or learning something new. That is also why Know What You Know is such an important step in the perfect programming process. So yes, this series is mostly about things you probably already know, at least to some degree, but it explores them in even greater detail, goes even deeper, like understanding what a variable really is, how the computer stores values in memory, how letters and emojis can be stored as binary codes, what binary codes actually are, and so on. I was thinking of naming this series Foundations of Programming, or The Fundamentals, or something like that. But aside from sounding way too pretentious, it would also make it seem as if it is absolutely necessary knowledge. Like, if you don't have this in your foundation, you can't continue building your tower of knowledge without it collapsing. And I don't want you to think of it as a need to know, more like a nice to know. There is this amazing interview with Tim Berners-Lee, the creator of the World Wide Web, where he describes how his generation grew up alongside the computer. I'll read you some excerpts. Thing came along at the right time, he explained. Anytime we understood one technology, the industry produced something more powerful that we could afford with our pocket money. In primary school, Berners-Lee and a friend hung around hobby shops where they used their allowance to buy electromagnets and make their own relays and switches. From that, they developed a deep understanding of what a bit was, how it could be stored and the things that could be done with a circuit. Just when they were outgrowing simple electromagnetic switches, transistors became common enough that he and his friend could buy a bag of a hundred pretty cheaply. We learned how to test transistors and use them to replace the relays we had built. In doing so, he could visualize what each component was doing by comparing them to the old electromagnetic switches they superseded. We began to imagine quite complicated logical circuits, but those became impractical because you would have to use too many transistors, he said. But just as he ran into that problem, microchips became available at the local electronic store. You buy these little bags of microchips with your pocket money and you realize you could make the core of a computer. Not only that, but you could understand the core of the computer because you had progressed from simple switches to transistors to microchips and knew how each one worked. My friends and I also tinkered with electromagnets and relays as kids, but we also had computers, quite sophisticated ones at that. And Berners-Lee and his whole generation already had a head start of around 20 years on us, and computers grew in complexity faster than we, than I certainly, could keep up with learning. So while that particular generation may have been in luck, it's an experience that cannot be recreated. It wouldn't make sense now for new programmers to learn about electromagnets, transistors, integrated circuits, microprocessor design, computer architecture, and so on before getting to write the first program. Nevertheless, I've heard several teachers and other old timers in the business argue, I learned everything from the ground up and so should they, while forgetting that the ground has moved significantly in the 20 or 40 years since they started and, and this is probably even more telling, they forget that they themselves didn't start with a ground that was defined 20 years prior, but rather somewhere in the middle and then learned both up and down from there. In my first programming class at university, we weren't allowed to touch the computers for the first month or so because the teachers wanted to give us a solid theoretical foundation first. This was before laptops, so we actually had to go to the computer lab at the university. But all of us did have powerful computers at home, so of course we did the programming anyways. We experimented, played around and largely ignored the theoretical stuff from the lectures in favor of getting some practical experience. Later on, we had to learn about microprocessor technology 
and our teachers had accepted that we could learn programming before understanding the hardware. But they still wanted us to start with the basics. Not with the really old processors from the 50s and 60s, but with one of the first microprocessors from the 70s. The argument being that, since it was first, it must, al it must also be basic. Unfortunately, the limited technology of the 70s had imposed all sorts of strange details, so we spent all of our time learning about the quirks and weirdness of that particular microprocessor and never really got around to what the basics actually were and thus never really got the necessary foundation to understand modern microprocessors. The main problem with beginning with the basics this way is that it doesn't follow Kierkegaard's advice and begin where the learner actually is. As a matter of fact, it doesn't even care, but force an arbitrary starting point on everyone, claiming that this is the basics that everyone needs in order to understand everything else. And the fact that so many teachers seem to think that the best place to begin just happens to be where or when they themselves began their journey only strengthens my argument that there doesn't seem to be any point in learning exactly these basics before anything else. The generation born in the mid 1950s were lucky to grow up with the technology. But those of us born in the 70s were lucky to grow up with computer games. Those born in the 90s were lucky to grow up with the web and so on. There's always some amazing development going on and no matter where you start, there'll always be something that came before and something that is worth understanding even deeper. But you don't have to understand how an electromagnet works in order to build a web app. And you don't need to be able to calculate in binary to write a 3D game. In fact, most of the basics tend to expose a lot of the underlying complexity of the computer. And our modern programming languages and tools actually try to hide that complexity for us. Not because we shouldn't know about it all, but because it's impossible to keep it all in your head at the same time. This book, The Design of Everyday Things, has become a classic in user experience and interface design, although it talks very little about computers and a lot about stoves, fridges and door handles. In it, Donald Norman describes the concept of mental models and how different users can have different representations of a system. He has examples with fridges and thermostats, and I never really understood why. In my mind, a thermostat works exactly as it should, and I'm incapable of imagining a different mental model. But maybe that's just me. While he mostly argues that designers should strive to design products or user interfaces so that they help users form a correct mental model, I find that the concept he describes also fits perfectly when it comes to programming. He has uh, this diagram in the book that I'll now try to explain from a programmer's point of view. Because when you're a programmer, you're also always a user of some system, or indeed systems that are designed and built by someone else. You use a programming language designed by someone, you write an editor made by someone else, you compile your program with a compiler built by someone completely different and run it in an environment created by someone else again. There's no way you can understand every detail in all of those systems. And even if you could, you wouldn't be able to contain every single interconnected part in your mind at the same time. You would have to have some models, some mental models of how each system works. Those mental models may be influenced by what you have learned previously, what you can read in the documentation, and the feedback you get from using the system. So they are not constant, but are revised whenever you learn something new. In addition to your own mental model, the system also presents an image of itself through its documentation, API specification, interface, and the feedback it provides it pretends to be working in a particular way. After all, when it comes down to it, all software is just moving numbers around inside the computer. But we like to think of systems in more abstract terms, 
like a browser displays text and graphics, a text editor modifies text depending on user input, a game moves a character around on the screen and keeps tracks of score, lives and enemy health status and so on. Different software, different applications present different system images. Whoever designed that software also had a model for thinking about it. If it's a programming tool, it's likely that they have tried as hard as they could to make the system image present their own design model, but there can still be differences. For instance, in most programming languages, you, the programmer, don't have to think about how to reserve memory for your variables. The designer has certainly thought about how the system should handle memory internally, but have abstracted it away so the system image presents itself as if that is uh, nothing to worry about. Mental models are necessary to understand anything at all to be able to think about complicated systems. And they are always different, not only from the actual system, but also between the designer and the user. Because the designer wants to protect the user from the underlying complexity and have thus built a system that presents a system image a bit different from how it actually is. And that is perfectly okay, because the mental model still helps us, the user, to understand what happens in the system when we use it, especially when we want to use it in a different way from how we usually do, when we want to try something new, when we want to learn. As Norman himself puts it, the power of mental models is that they let you figure out what would happen in novel situations. Or if you're actually doing the task and there is a problem, they let you figure out what is happening. If the model is wrong, you will be wrong too. So the better your mental model is, the closer it is to how the system actually is, not only how it presents itself, the better you'll be equipped to understand what goes on. And the closer your mental model is to the designer's model, the better you'll be equipped to learn something new about the system, new ways of using it, better ways, ways that might suit your current problem better than you have done before. And the worse your mental model is, the worse you'll be at predicting what might happen, and the harder it'll be for you to discover mistakes, debug code, and fix problems. An important aspect of learning more about the basics is to adjust and refine your mental model of the system, or the various systems you use as a programmer. Even if it seems that your current mental model works just fine for the kind of program you are doing right now, it might be that it only works for what you are currently doing. It might hold you back from learning new things. An incorrect or incomplete mental model might have been enough to bring you where you are now, but in order to move on, to travel beyond programming, you need a better one. A wrong model could keep you stuck where you are and actually prevent you from learning new things, simply because they won't fit into the model. And that is what it is all about, learning more and moving beyond programming. I do believe that programming is more than simply learning how some systems work and building perfect mental models of those. It is also about creativity. Writing a program is a creative undertaking, like uh, writing a novel is. Of course, writing the actual words and sentences using correct grammar and punctuation aren't all that creative. But creating a world, crafting a story, designing characters, that is very creative. And the same goes for programming. Writing the actual code is just coding, filling in blanks. But designing the overall program and understanding, deciding how to make the computer solve something, that is creative. Programming is never the same. You never have to write the exact same program twice. If you did, you'd just take the first version and reuse that. And even though a lot of the problems are the same, the solutions need not be. You can always solve a problem in numerous different ways, and you can invent new solutions to existing problems. They might not be better, but they will be different. 
Some parts of one program might be identical to parts of another program. Some patterns might be reused. As a programmer, you'll build a collection of preferred solutions to common problems. And different programmers have their own preferences, their own style, just like painters and authors. Some patterns will appear in a lot of programs, just like a lot of stories have the reluctant hero that is pressured to go on an adventure, meets an older mentor, rescues a friend, faces almost certain dead, battles a foe, and returns home a changed person. But the difference, the creativity, is in the details, how the story is told, how the well-known patterns are used in a unique way. And knowing and understanding those patterns, the parts that make up a story, or indeed a program, makes you better at it. It's difficult to pinpoint exactly what creativity is or how to become better at it, but Danish researcher Lena Tanko has this model that I really like. She argues that uh, there are these three elements to creativity, like the ingredients required to become more creative within a field. We have experimentation and tinkering, resistance from the material, and immersion in tradition or craft. The first one, experimentation and tinkering, is almost self-evident. I mean, if you want to learn something, if you want to become good at it, you need to experiment. You need to try new things to see what happens, and you need to work with the subject outside of structured assignments. When you tinker, you play, you toy around with things, not with any particular goal in sight, but just to try different things. And you learn without realizing that you are learning. In fact, uh, Tango has a book titled something akin to Learning Forgetfulness, where she argues very convincingly, I might add, that we learn more and better when we are not trying to learn, when we are not aware that we are learning. But that's not what this series is about. So let's get back to the model for creativity. The second part, resistance from the material, may sound a bit strange, but makes perfect sense when you think about it. If everything is straightforward, easy, and you can just do it, you're never really challenged, so you don't really learn anything. You just do. But if you're somehow halted in your progress, if an idea you had wasn't possible, then you have to get creative. Something as simple as a puddle on the path when walking in the forest. It'll make you stop and think, what do I do now? Maybe you can step around, maybe you can jump over, maybe you can wade through. There's no fixed solution, no predetermined way this must be handled. In programming, this happens almost constantly. Every time you encounter a part you don't know how to write, or as happened almost as often, when you encounter something you thought you knew how to write, but it turned out to be more difficult. Then you have to step away from just working and get creative. Maybe research, maybe experiment, but certainly learn. The third part, immersion in tradition and or craft, might be the most surprising. Because why would you need to immerse yourself in tradition and learn about whatever came before in order to create something new, to be creative? I'll let her explain it herself. It's in Danish, but I'll add subtitles and paraphrase afterwards. Fuskeri for fuskeriets egen skyld, eller eksperimentet for eksperimentets egen skyld, er ofte uinteressant. Hvis ikke du ved, hvad der er gammelt, kan du ikke se, hvad der er nyt. Hvis det er rigtigt, at guldet ligger i traditionen ofte, så bliver vi også nødt til at have en skole eller et uddannelsessystem, der har en respekt omkring det, der har været, og ser det som en drivkraft. Fordi vi, vi på mange måder har haft det svært i en pædagogisk verden med at håndtere det faktum, at det gamle jo er forældet allerede, inden vi ser os om. Så hvor, hvad skal vi bruge det til? Altså, øh, og, og, og tesen i dag er, at vi, skal, altså, vi kan i virkeligheden ikke bruge indhold til noget som helst, så vi skal bare lære de studerende at lære at lære. Metakompetencer taler vi alle sammen om. Men jeg er så old school, at jeg tænker, at fordybelsen ned i et enkelt fagområde rent faktisk kan give en den metakompetence, som vi kalder at lære at lære. 
Altså, der er ikke nogen modsætning mellem at gå dybt og kunne gå bredt. Hvis vi hele tiden skal gå bredt, så risikerer vi bare at rise i overfladen hele vejen igennem. Og så får vi ikke beredskabet til, når vi møder noget, vi ikke havde forestillet os, og så kunne gøre noget nyt og noget kreativt. It's important to know what came before, if you want to know if you have created something new. But also learning in depth about what you kind of already know on a surface level actually strengthens your ability to learn. It helps you learn to learn. I want to add that learning about the history and tradition of programming also strengthens your ability to solve new and unknown problems. For one, those problems might not be as new as you think. Just because you haven't encountered them before doesn't mean that no one else has. And by learning about different particular problems and their solutions, you extend your ability to recognize patterns and apply suitable solutions. Recognizing something as a knapsack problem or a binary tree or a state machine immediately helps you find a solution for it without having to reinvent everything yourself. Maybe not exactly standing on the shoulders of giants, but at least learning from others' experiences. Again, just like knowing a lot of classic stories, knowing a lot about storytelling will make you a better writer. Not because there are rules and systems that you must follow, but because you get some blocks to build with, to be creative with. And then, of course, being interested in the history and tradition of one's craft is always a good thing. In fact, just being interested is a valuable quality. A general state of curiosity never hurt anyone, not even the cat. There's this famous quote from Richard Feynman, whom I have mentioned before and certainly will again, that everything is interesting if you go into it deeply enough. And I'd like to add that it only gets more interesting the deeper you go into it. In fact, Feynman himself said something to that effect in an interview where he talked about the beauty of flowers. I have a friend who's an artist and he's sometimes taken a view which I don't agree with very well. He'll hold up a flower and say, look how beautiful it is. And I'll agree. I, and he says, you see, as I as an artist can see how beautiful this is. But you as a scientist, oh, take this all apart and it becomes dull thing. And I think that he's kind of nutty. First of all, the beauty that he sees is available to other people and to me too. I believe, although I may not be quite as refined as aesthetically as he is, that I can appreciate the beauty of a flower. At the same time, I see much more about the flower than he sees. I could imagine the cells in there, the complicated actions inside, which also have a beauty. I mean, it's not just beauty at this dimension of one centimeter, there's also beauty at a smaller dimensions. The inner structure, also the processes, the fact that the colors and the flower evolved in order to attract insects to pollinate it is interesting. It means that insects can see the color. It adds a question. Does this aesthetic sense also exist in the lower forms? That are, does it, why is it aesthetic? All kinds of interesting questions which the science knowledge only adds to the excitement, the mystery and the awe of a flower. It only adds. I don't understand how it subtracts. I like, no, actually love how he gets all excited just talking about all the other things that could also be interesting to learn when you learn a bit more about the flower. Like, what about the animals around it? Do they also appreciate the flower? What does it even mean that something is beautiful? Where do we think that something is beautiful? He doesn't ask those questions of his artist friend. He wants to ask them of nature. I heard the argument from people like Feynman's friend quite often, not only when it comes to nature and science, but also stories and even jokes like that. If you explain it, you destroy it, prevent others from enjoying it. I don't understand where that attitude comes from. I mean, I agree that a joke isn't funny if you have to explain it in order for someone to understand it at all. But a good joke or a good story doesn't suddenly become bad if you analyze it and understand it on a deeper level. 
In fact, a lot of good stories really grow when you analyze them and discover that there's a lot more beneath the surface, that it actually does become more interesting the deeper you go into it. Of course, bad stories that are merely a shiny surface on an empty shell will suffer from a deeper analysis because it will show that there isn't anything there. And perhaps that's what they're afraid of, those who don't like to go deeper, that their analysis and understanding will reveal that there was nothing there, that they were enjoying something that was just a hollow shell. Maybe. I don't know. Or maybe they are afraid that they will become lost in the depth and complexity of it all, like not being able to see the forest for all the trees. I can certainly relate to that. I mean, even though computers are made by humans, they are still almost infinitely complex. And it does indeed seem that the more you learn about them, the more there still is to learn. Almost like in nature, there seems to be no end to the complexity. And it can be really difficult, if not outright impossible, to connect the understanding of the tiniest details, like transistors and logic gates, to the overall experience of running programs on the computer. But that is why we have the mental models, not just a single one, but several, even layers of them. When we understand what goes on inside one layer, we close it, so to speak, and think of it as a system used by the other layers. So we have systems of systems. Another argument from people like Feynman's friend could be that they feel like they are done with learning. Like, school is for learning and I'm done with school, so I should be done with learning. While I don't agree with that statement at all, I might have an idea of why some are feeling that way. I have attended numerous graduation ceremonies, and there's always this speech about uh, now your learning really starts, so far you have been mostly learning how to learn, and everybody sighs a bit and makes a grimace, because, well, they were just celebrating that it was over, that they were done, not just reaching a milestone, but actually done. I myself had a bit of a crisis a few years after graduating. At first, I really enjoyed working with my new knowledge and even gathering more knowledge about the systems used at my workplace, about the processes and technologies used to build stuff. Then I changed jobs and again had to learn about their processes and technologies. Then some new innovations came along and I once again had to learn about different processes and technologies. At some point I felt like I was just relearning the same bit over and over again. All my program did was to get input from a user and store it somewhere. At first I had to learn how to do it with variables, then with files, then with network transmissions, then with files transmitted over the network. First it was XML, then it became JSON, and so on and on it went. I got sick and tired of having to start over. Always a new language, always a new framework, always another way of doing basically the same. That is until I realized it wasn't about learning all the new stuff. It was about understanding the basics so that I could quickly apply them to any newfangled technology that came and went. If I understood the basics well enough and had solid mental models for them, then it would be easier for me to reuse those models for the new stuff. But maybe more important than that, I learned that I didn't have to replace anything. I shouldn't throw away my previous learning and replace it with the new stuff. Rather, I should adjust my understanding refit the mental models so that they both match the old and the new. So by constantly learning, I keep my mental models malleable and prepared for changes. I don't stick religiously to one interpretation and reject everything that challenges it. Rather, I keep it alive, make it absorb new knowledge and connect it somehow to everything else. Also, I realized that bit like the graduation speeches said, while it is a journey, there's no fixed destination. Like life itself, you are where you are and you're probably going to end up somewhere, but only at the very end. So you might as well learn to enjoy the journey, learn to enjoy learning 
and be curious. So, to recap, to paraphrase Kierkegaard, you are where you are. There's no point in rewinding to some arbitrary place in history and then learn everything from there and forward to now. But as Tango argues, it does make a lot of sense to dive into history and understand what lies behind, beneath, beyond, however we phrase it, and get a deeper understanding of your craft, both in order to be more creative, but also to get better at learning. And as Norman suggests, improving your conceptual models of how the system works will improve your ability to handle unexpected situations. And I like to add, also makes it easier to learn about different systems, and different technologies. But most important of all, I think that Feynman expresses it best. The pure joy of knowing, not of having all the answers, but of finding them, of examining things, of understanding them at a still deeper level, or merely of understanding that there are deeper levels. I think that it could all be about that, simply being curious, simply deriving pleasure from finding things out. And with that, I welcome you to the basics.